The challenge with The Hobbit really is that we wanted to be the same filmmakers going back into Middle Earth, shooting a movie in much the same style. But of course, a lot of the events of The Hobbit are actually establishing the world that is later developed in The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien was still exploring Middle Earth when he was writing The Hobbit, and I don't believe he had himself a very clear idea of what Middle Earth was going to become, which provides an increased latitude on the filmmaker's part to actually delve a little deeper than it was possible in Lord of the Rings. Oh, that's quite interesting. We could cross-reference Peter's descriptions with Tolkien's original writing to create a unique vision which became a sort of art department collective idea. It was important visually with The Hobbit that it feels like a slightly more idyllic time. I mean, the, the, the darkness that descends on this world in The Lord of the Rings, it's brewing, but it hasn't yet expanded to the levels that it's going to. So the world is a more innocent, simple place, and we wanted to reflect that in the photography and the design. It should look like everyone's notion of what Sherwood Forest would be like in a summer sunny day. Peter felt that the whimsy and the delight of it should be apparent in everything we do. And it just needs to be just that little bit of something extra. Every new project is a challenge. And uh, The Hobbit hasn't really disappointed in that respect. Forty leagues it stretched from the far downs to the Brandywine Bridge and fifty from the northern moors to the marshes in the south. The Hobbits named it the Shire. Hobbiton is something that we've established pretty extensively, so you can't really mess with that too much, except it's 60 years earlier and it's midsummer. This was a slightly more innocent time, so that in turn affected uh, colour treatments. Everything is lush, the grass is all green, the flowers are all blooming. Ah, smell that, it's beautiful. Hobbiton's a pretty special place. It has all of the elements of good design. It had to be a working environment for a film crew, but it also needed to be fully immersive and believable. Fortunately, this is the time where it just sort of just starts to do its magical thing. It's just one of those sets that's the epitome of the magic of the creation of Middle Earth. Like, <laughs> it, it exists. And you can kind of walk around and forget you're in a movie set. And the cool thing is, is this time around they built it for real. This is the second incarnation of Hobbiton. We built this 10 years ago for Lord of the Rings. And at the end of that shoot, we removed the whole set. We took away all our Hobbit holes. We took away the whole thing and just left it as a pasture, farmland. Because initially, as the story goes, the farmer actually didn't really want the film production to leave anything here. So he was quite happy when the film production decided to, you know, look, we're going to build it, but we're going to tear it down. And over the years, as the Lord of the Rings films got released, um, this place became really popular. People came here as a holiday destination, as a fan destination. There wasn't an awful lot left. We went to visit, I believe, in November 2008, and most of the Hobbit holes were gone. Bag End was a facade in plywood painted white with round hole, small round windows. And even that became popular with tourists who just wanted to go and see where Hobbiton used to be. And when The Hobbit came around and we, you know, needed Hobbiton again, obviously we, we went straight back to the Alexanders, to the owners of the farm, and said, listen, do you mind if we rebuild Hobbiton again? Because we kind of need to come back here again. It was probably five years ago that Peter sent us a letter and said he's interested in making The Hobbit again and, and uh, wanting to come back. It was an idea I had of, look, you know, why don't we build it out of permanent materials this time, not polystyrene? Because so many people had been to visit that farm and I thought, well, it's an opportunity to actually have Hobbiton there now. Peter wanted to do Hobbiton properly, and so we were using real wood and real slate and real materials that were going to be there for years to come. This is the remaining uh, Hobbit hole, original Hobbit hole, and looking back... So where we might take shortcuts and do a small retaining wall for the structure of these Hobbit holes, there was none of that. We had to excavate these holes, fully retain them in accordance with the local requirements. 
can see the bracing into the hillside, five metres into the hill. The tieback system, we have these um, steel rods going into the hill. G'day, Dan. Hey, Matt, good? How's it? Excellent. As far as the construction side of things, it was more complicated, no doubt, but where the trick really lay was in completing Hobbiton in reasonable time before the shoot. On a lot of the rings, we set ourselves up with a year for Hobbiton to grow in. And this time round, we weren't going to be nearly so lucky. We were due to shoot Hobbiton in February, which is the end of New Zealand summer. So we had a limited amount of time to do it. And we were a little concerned because it, the Hobbiton had only been in the ground for six months at that stage. And the grass wasn't quite long enough at that point. And we were thinking, ooh, we're a little bit nervous that it just wasn't quite going to be lush enough. But then uh, there was a slight delay. We got wind that of Peter's illness, and so Hobbiton went off the schedule. We missed an opportunity to film during the summertime and it wasn't going to be any good if we didn't have Hobbiton in its full bloom. So they had to push this particular set a year on. This is a great spot. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's probably the most stacked up. Oh, there's another bit down by the there's lake. another bit down by the lake, yeah. There was nothing better for Hobbiton than to have been delayed. I mean, much as Peter had to get sick to do it, uh, and we all feel sorry for that, it certainly helped us in that we got a whole year of um, growth, regrowth. It was an amazing difference between when we were ready to shoot the first time and when we actually shot the second time. What happened is we left all the objects on the set and let nature just sort of grab them and they incorporated them into this sort of really comfortable landscape. All these vines and creepers and grasses, they weren't just this big, they were this big. This arrangement's been sitting here for a year and it's just got all the grass and all the gorgeous stuff growing up through it. It's almost melted into the landscape, which is really lovely. Time gives you something that really good planning just can't give you. A sort of authenticity that we couldn't have even hoped for. Hi, welcome to Bag End, the home of Bilbo Baggins, the flashiest hobbit hole in the Shire. Just uh, check his mail here. A bit of junk mail. I'll take that in for him. This is uh, Bilbo's garden. Hobbits generally have to grow their own uh, produce because um, there aren't any supermarkets in Hobbiton. And he does a pretty good job with help from uh, Sam Ganji and uh, the Greens department. So uh, I've just been visiting uh, Gaffer Ganji. This is Three Bagshot Row, Sam Ganji's house, in about 60 years' time. You know, one of the lovely things about Hobbiton is that there are 44 homes that hobbits live in in the immediate Hobbiton area. And like any society, there are rich people, there are poor people, there's middle class people, there's sort of all that in between. And so we tried to bring that to Hobbiton. You have to look at each hobbit hold as who lives there? What do they do? This is uh, Wood Chopper Hobbit. He supplies all of the wood for the fireplaces for the entire Dell area, the neighbourhood here. You can also see up there the, uh, the washing station, so all the hobbits in this uh, neighbourhood get together and do their washing. The work ethic of a hobbit means that the laundry probably stays out for a couple of weeks before it gets changed around. <laughs> this is the chicken farmer's house here in Hobbiton. Um, we come in and just add a few details like the nest here. Um, awning, or little hand tools and things, this bell. As you go further over towards the lakeside, there are much more fishermen's dwellings. This is the fishing village lane. There's a lot of eels in Green Dragon Lake. There are, in fact, some quite big ones in there. These are um, plastic ones, of course. This is a hobbit coracle. 
the most basic of vessels. Doesn't get a lot of use because hobbits don't like water, of course. Although there was a time when we were first introduced to Smeagol and he had a coracle that was quite similar. And of course, he was into fishing. Was everything here, was it all the same or is there more now? Or? There's more, apparently. Well, there's meant to be more up on the hill. If you're looking at the hillside where Bag End is, to the right of those, there's five extra holes that we built and put in there that weren't there on Lord of the Rings. This is the new subdivision. It's just popped up in the last hundred years or so. What we've got here is a potter. From a distance, you wouldn't think that there was much going on there, except he's got this huge chimney attached to the front of the house. And there's an opening in the front of the chimney, and it's just chock-a-block with fresh clay pots baking in the sun. Originally, Guillermo wanted Bilbo to race out and run past those hobbit holes off down the side of the hill, but Peter has him turn a hard right and jump down the bank. So this is uh, Gandalf's cutting. It's where Gandalf first came to Hobbiton, and it's also where the guys came back after the Lord of the Rings, the four hobbits on their ponies, and it's, it's a big reveal of Hobbiton. So I think this is one of the nicest angles to look at Hobbiton from, coming up over the largest of the three veggie gardens here at Hobbiton. Uh, all the produce is real, cabbages, lettuces, carrots, artichokes, all sorts, and spread throughout with flowers. But in Hobbiton, even overgrown dandelions are pretty. There is one beautifully sculpted rubber tree with silk leaves, and it sits on top of Bag End. It's actually bigger than our first oak from Lord of the Rings up there and far stronger. So that needed some serious structure within it because we have to cater for high winds and the longevity of it being up there for 25 years. So that's the only non-deciduous oak tree in the world, I bet. <laughs> There's a boundary around Hobbiton. It's basically the horizon in every direction. There's nothing to break the illusion because if you look out over the hills, all you see is effectively what is the Shire. There's no denying it. It's beautiful from every angle and it also has the sound effects to boot. G'day. Hey, how are you? Good, thanks. Good. 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 Nice to meet you. Good, Good to meet you, eh? <laughs> How far away is the Green Dragon? So here we are at the Green Dragon, the local pub here in Hobbiton. This is where the hobbits like to come and have a drink after a um, hard day's work. This time round we've had the opportunity to rebuild it as a permanent structure and we're looking at putting a little bar in there so, so it really is the Green Dragon. So we did that and it's basically inside and outside is fully themed and so now people go there and they have their pint in the Green Dragon pub. But I've worked off a bit of a thirst, so I'm going to help myself to a beer here. Cheers. Hobbiton, the location, has finally succumbed to its destiny, really, and that it has gone from film set. It's actually kind of turned into Hobbiton for real now. We've actually, you know, left something behind that's permanent that represents one of the settings of the movie, and I think it's really cool. It's one of those places, and I understand now why people, you know, cross the world to make a pilgrimage to Hobbiton. It's kind of like going home. We completely rebuilt the Bag End sets on B stage, which is a very small, low stage. B stage is the last remaining tin shed here at Stone Street, but it's where we shot Bag End on Lord of the Rings, so it has historical, um, a historical place. Candle! <laughs> come on, come in! It is like walking into the universe of Middle-earth, it's so 
incredible, the detail in that place. I could spend hours and hours and hours looking through books and going into all the rooms. Our very first day on the job, before we started filming, we went and we had a whole tour of Bag End. That was cool, that was the coolest day. It's just so detailed, all the rooms. We've seen it all in The Fellowship of the Rings, but actually to walk on it and walk around the set was just pretty mind-blowing. The first impression was, crikey, wouldn't it be lovely to live in this house? It created an atmosphere immediately. Do you know what I mean? You're not having to conjure up, what sort of place does Bilbo live in? Because all I'm looking at is a green studio. You knew exactly where, where he was. You can't underestimate the effect that something like that has on you. It's quite emotional going in there. Very easy to remember moments. I was sitting by the fire and I said, I took hold of the fire tongues, which are still there. I said, look, there's the ring. It's quite cool. It's quite cool. <laughs> and being a fan, the fact that I was in Bag End at all was, was a level of joy that I can't even, you know. Every day I'd just walk around and have a look at a little, ooh, wow, look. And you're looking at, at April, the calendar that he had, and He's doing this on this particular day, and everywhere you look, there is depth to the reality that you had invested in. I really used to enjoy to just go into Bag End and just look around and just imagine. It's such an odd place. It's shaped like a womb anyway, isn't it? It's all round and friendly, and it's got all of the qualities that we can't have with our quite rectangular environments. On well, Lord of the Rings, Bilbo was older, and so was Bag End. Bilbo had obviously been on an adventure because his hallways were piled high with books and scrolls and wonderful things all put falling out of drawers, sort of trinkets from other places. There was an orc helmet and a couple of old swords hanging on the wall and, you know, slightly more random. Which was the older, wiser Bilbo Baggins. But now Bilbo's a young man. He still has a sort of semblance of tidiness. Everything was a lot more organised. Everything had its place and everything was put back where it should go. The plates were all stacked nicely in the kitchen, the books were all on the bookshelf, you know, the floors were clean. It's not quite as dusty and dirty, but it's still very hobbity. The things we didn't do in, uh, in Bag End in Lord of the Rings is we didn't go into his bedroom, we didn't go into his dining room, and we didn't go into his pantry. So those were new areas that we had some design licence for. I designed a pantry ten years ago, but it wasn't needed for the movie. So this was an opportunity to go back and do a little more work. You know, the pantry is stacked full of food. Very inviting sort of place. You look in there and you just want to eat something immediately. The walnuts are fresh. From an art direction point of view, the pantry was a huge challenge for us. You wanted the food to have quite an extravagance to it. Well, you know, the food is really important that you get it right. You're not just feeding the mouth or the stomach, you're feeding the eye. With Hobbit food, even more so than normal. And we spent weeks poring over ideas for this sort of pie and that sort of roast. It was an involved effort on our food stylist part. We're here in my portacom. I've got this station, there's a temporary kitchen next to B stage where we're shooting so that I can deliver the food as fast as possible. So all that ham hocks, black pudding, leg of mutton, that leg of ham. All the food had to be real because you didn't know when someone was going to pick something up and bite it. And you have to be prepared for when Peter says, I like the look of that cheese up there, let's use that. One of the dwarves picks it up and goes, ooh, what's this smelly stuff? And throws it, oh, so <laughs> I didn't mean to. He does throw it over his shoulder. We're in the pantry in Bag End and we're redressing the entire pantry back to how it was probably only two days ago. It feels more like about two years ago at the moment. But Deborah has supplied all the food and if you want to hang around a little bit, you'll see it all be put into place. This is the second time I've reset it. 
pretty phenomenal when you stand in the middle of it and it's all these cured meats and cheeses and not a piece of shelf space free. You know, you could survive several nuclear winters and you'd be fine. <laughs> We did build a dining room for Bag End in the early days of Lord of the Rings, but we never shot it. It's sort of, you know, when you get it's good. I like, yeah, I like the hype here, it's good. It's it sort it of with the dwarfs and stuff, but then big heads and things. The dining room was very carefully constructed because we wanted 13 dwarves and a hobbit and a wizard to feel very squished in there. So we made the dimensions of the room fit around them. I wouldn't make the table any, any smaller, though, because no, it's no. good that everyone's sort of the distance apart is good. We changed the size of the dining room umpteen times, initially to make it big enough for all the dwarves, then to make it small enough so they had to crowd in. We dressed the dining room with some really subtle materials. We used gorgeous parchment paper for a lot of the artwork on the walls. And the glazed plates were all hand-painted. Things that I think about and get excited about were all the crockery in that. Our potter on this was just an absolute champion. He produced so much work. There was close to maybe 2,000 items all up, so yeah, it was intense. I think he got the, uh, the award for the most tons of props, and Bag End would have been probably the place where he shined the most. I mean, he's got a pretty nice place. He's got a damn fine place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's done well. Bilbo's bedroom was always going to be a little more than just a hole in the ground. The idea was that he would, you know, he'd have a four post bed and he'd have a fireplace in there, and obviously a window that looked out over Hobbiton. There was a little bit more of a feeling of, of opulence. You know, there's a bit of wealth in the Baggins family, and the bedroom was the place where we had this uh, bed that had a real sense of royalty sort of character to it. You imagine not every hobbit would have a bed like that. It may have seemed crazy at the time to hand stitch a lot of the fabric, but the moment we saw it next to Bilbo Baggins' face lying in the bed, that was kind of the payoff. 90% of the work that you do doesn't really get seen, but the 10% that does make it in made it all worthwhile. Bag End was the greatest thing we could have done at the beginning because, you know, as a set, it's iconic. It's such a familiar place. And once we walked in there and the lights were there and the camera crew were squeezed in, it really didn't feel that we had been away. It's such a magical spot. It really is very, very beautiful. You could almost imagine living there. I could, I could imagine myself living in Bag End, honestly. It is a great set. I think of all the sets that I've had the pleasure of walking through in the films I've made, I, I think Bag End would be my absolute favorite. Thank you.